to know what is psychiatry. The German doctor Johann Reed originated the term psychiatry from the Greek root psyche, that means mind, and iatros, that means treatment. So, psychiatry, in short, was like the treatment of mind. The definition goes like this. Psychiatry or psychological medicine can be defined as that branch of medicine concerned with the study, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disorders of the mind. Here, what you have to remember is the German doctor, Johann Reel, and the word psychiatry is originated from the Greek root psyche and iatros. That means psyche is mind and iatros is free. Psychiatric disorders, the synonyms are like insanity or mental illness, mental diseases, emotional disorders, behavioral disorders, functional disorders. So these are some of the other terms used for psychiatric disorders. And psychology deals with scientific study of behavior of normal man and animal. So you have to see that. It is not only the behavior of human being, but also animals. The evolution of psychiatry in that you have to remember more the moral treatment of insane was initiated by Philippe Pino in France in the 18th century by setting free the lunatics from chains. That is why he is called as the father of psychiatry. So it is Philippe Pino. Uh, people mistake his name with Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud is the father of psychoanalytical psychotherapy. Okay, uh, so here Philippe Pinel is the father of psychiatry. Now, the laws providing for the admission, detention, and discharge of lunatics into such lunatic asylums were also formed during those times, and these were called as lunacy acts. Now we'll go to the signs and symptoms of mental disorders. So the first one is the disturbance of mood. So the term affect means the momentary attenuation of emotions, the momentary change. Okay? Whereas the mood is the sustained emotional state. So mood is something that the patient tells us that is a subject to symptoms, whereas affect is something we can observe in the patient. Okay, that effect. The pleasant mood states are euphoria, that means mild elevation of mood, elation, that is a moderate elevation of mood with increased psychomotor activity. Excitation, that is it, it includes the elevation of mood plus the increased psychomotor activity along with delusion of grandeur. Now, ecstasy is a blissful feeling. That is an extreme sense of well-being. So these four are the pleasant mood states and it is the stages, okay, how the uh, pleasant mood states goes on. So the unpleasant mood states, that is the dysphoric mood. That is anxiety is one, that is the unpleasant fearful mood. Okay, unpleasant fearful mood. And depression is a sadness of mood, irritability and hatred also belongs to this. The other mood states are one is apathy, that is a loss of emotional expression, and hedonia, that is unable to feel or share pressure, then blunting or flattening. So incongruous. So the word incongruous means when mood is not in harmony or congruent to the ideas of actions. So when we tell that incongruous means the mood and the effect. That is a mood is a subjective symptom of the subjective mood that the patient tells to us, whereas the effect is something we can see in the patient. So if that is not the mood is not in harmony with the effect, you can tell that is an incongruence. Now let's see the disturbance of thinking. What can be the symptoms of disturbance in thinking? For that, you have to know what is a thinking or a thought. So thinking or thought. It is the goal directed arousal of symbols, ideas, and associations 
leading to a reality oriented conclusion okay so now we can see that the disturbance of thinking can be divided into the symptoms that comes under formal thought of stream and of abnormal content so first one we'll see what is formal thought in that the first symptom is loosening of association so here the loosening of association means no meaningful relation occurs between the ideas okay next is the flight of ideas that is he jumps from or the patient jumps from topic to topic in quick succession the ideas are related to each other and they are comprehensible next is neologism that is formation of new words which have no meaning to others preservation that is involuntary repetition of the same talk that means talk or activity can be given in response to a stimulus when a subsequent stimulus is present so we have to know these symptoms so that when we are going to see each and every diseases only the terms will be used okay so that is why it is important to know what does these symptoms means so losing of association there is no meaning correlation between the ideas flight of ideas means jumping from topic to topic but they are related and we can understand it as comprehensible and neologism means is a formation of new words with no meaning at all and preservation is the involuntary repetition of the same thought it can be a talk or activity or anything in response to a stimulus okay so now next set of symptoms comes under a stream okay the thought of stream one is thought block that means when the stream of the talk suddenly stops in the midst and fails to proceed further so that is called as a thought block pressure of talk so here what happens is the ideas continue to rush out of the mind due to its richness so the patient will be continuously talking uh, so it is will, will be very difficult to stop the patient or to interrupt the patient okay next is the poverty of thinking here the talk is scanty and the flow is very slow next is a circumstantiality so here we can see that the talk is prolonged by lengthy narration of the unwanted details before coming to the right point finally so here we know that the patient how he will be narrating the symptoms to us is like if we ask him something for example we can ask him where is his house he may not tell exactly what it is he may start from somewhere else like he came from his house to the clinic by some walk and then he went and at last he will come here yeah, my house is at some place so he will go everywhere else and then come back to the right point at last now the tangential thinking so here what happens is the flow of talk deviates in different direction and the final goal is not at all reached so here the patient may start with like if i ask where where is this house is he will tell my house my house is built with brick or oh, bricks are there the bricks can be found at some other place so it will go from one topic to another without reaching to the destination okay so that is called the tangential thing next is of abnormal content here the main thing is delusions so what do you mean by delusion it is a false it's a notion which cannot be corrected even by giving evidence to the contrary so how much ever we try to give evidence and correct the person the person will not believe at risk of getting that much evidence also okay that is called a delusion it's a false and fixed notion which cannot be corrected even by giving evidence to the contrary now mainly uh the delusions are classified like primary delusion and secondary delusion okay the primary delusion is otherwise called as autotentonous delusions okay it is the sudden development of delusion without being preceded by any psychological event in the back so it is a sudden development of delusion now secondary delusions are there they occur as a consequence of some psychological events such as mood changes hallucinations 
delusions or others. Now, the other types of delusions can be like desire and non-desire. So, desire is something like the imagining impossible situation. So, we, there will be no rational thinking in that. It is completely impossible things. And non-desire is, it can be something possible. Okay, But here also, it is a fixed notion. Now, next is the mood congruent and mood incongruent. So, mood congruent is like based on what the mood that patient is having at that time. And based on that, there is a delusion. It can be like example in mania. That is when there is a hyperactivity, hyperenergic level. The patient may be thinking like a, uh, having a delusion of grandiose. Okay? That he is rich, he is having a lot of money or he is super high and superpowers like that. That is mood congruent. Okay. Next is mood incongruent is like it happens without a particular mood's influence. Okay, there is no influence of mood. So that is the mood congruent and mood incongruent. Now the various types or various kinds of delusions are these are the uh, most common ones. Okay, on a persecutory. So he believes that there are some secret plots that is made against him. Either he's like poisoned or he's spied upon and so on. So that is called a persecutory delusion. Next is grandiose. That is, he believes that he is very powerful or that he is a big scholar or scientist or he is rich. Okay. So that is grandiose delusion. Next is delusion of poverty. So it is just the opposite of grandiose. Here the patient believes that he is extremely poor having lost everything and he may even start begging. So that is the delusion of poverty. Next is the guilt, delusion of guilt. Here the patient is a sinner who has done sinful deeds in the past or in the previous birth and attributes guilt to himself. Next is nihilistic. So the delusion of nihilistic is that he believes that the part of his body or he himself or the world itself is not existing. Next is the delusion of infidelity. It is otherwise called as amorous delusions, jealous husband syndrome, or jealous wife syndrome, or it is otherwise called as pathological jealousy. So here we see the symptoms like the patient is believing that the spouse is having an illicit sexual relation. So despite of giving the evidence to the contrary, also they will still go on believing it. Next is the delusion of control. Here the patient's belief is that his thoughts, mood and actions are being controlled by people outside. And the delusions of love or erotomania, it is wrongly believed that someone is in sincere love with him or her. So mostly we can see that in that uh, the people believe that some movie stars or some people who are uh, rich is being in love with him or her. So they will sincerely be give love letters, they will send them and do like that. So even though it is proved that they there is no connection or there is that person doesn't know, still they goes on believing that they are loved by that other person. Now we'll see uh, what are obsessions. So obsessions are like the recurrent intrusion of unwanted thoughts into mind in spite of the efforts made to stop it. So these are mainly thoughts. So they are unwanted thoughts, but it repeatedly coming to us even if we try to stop it. Okay. So in spite of the efforts to stop it, those thoughts will be repeatedly coming to us. So that are called the obsessions. Now, phobias, it is kind of fear, specific one object or a situation which are normally harmless. So, normal things are like fear, but when the fear to an object where it is normally harmless, in spite of that also, the person is having extreme fear, it is called a phobia. Next is suicidal ideas. So, these are the symptoms or these are the uh, things that comes under abnormal content. So the main symptoms in the abnormal contents are one is delusions. We saw the different kinds of delusions and next is obsessions that is like the unwanted thoughts that are coming 
next is phobias and last one is suicidal ideas next are symptoms that comes under opposition okay here there is thought deprivation or thought withdrawal the patient believes that the ideas are stolen or taken away from his mind next is thought insertion so it is the opposite here the belief is that the ideas are introduced into his mind from outside agencies and next one is a thought broadcast that is a belief that the thoughts are or the unexpressed thoughts are known to others as soon as it occurs to him so mainly these symptoms come for schizophrenia next is the disturbance of perception so we'll see what are the symptoms that comes under disturbance of perception perception is the cognitive process of becoming aware of the objects and the environment around us by the way of the sense organs okay so we can now know that the symptoms mainly occur, occurring is it hallucinations illusions macropsia macropsia are the common disturbances of perception now the hallucination is the vivid sensory or perceptual ex experience occurring in the absence of a corresponding external object or stimulus so the main thing you have to notice is that there is an absence of the corresponding external object or stimulus okay next is the lily pocket hallucinations so here the hallucinatory objects especially the people appear much smaller okay so you know the story gulliver's travel in that gulliver is a giant whereas like all the other people appears to be small the small people so it is kind of a lilliputian hallucination okay auditory and haptic hallucinations are common in schizophrenia so auditory is the hearing and haptic is nothing other than the tactile okay? Visual hallucinations are common in organic disorders. Okay. Now the other two uh, hallucinations they are like hypnagogic and hypnopompic. So hypnagogic hallucinations are the hallucinations that occurs when one goes to sleep or one falls to sleep. That is hypnagogic. And hypnopompic hallucinations are the one that occurs when the person is awakening from the sleep. Okay. so these two can be a common phenomenon and they can occur normal at times now let us see some of the hallucinations and in which typical disorder has those hallucinations so this one is auditory so some of the hallucinations that are auditory is like the third person like a running commentary it is called a third person hallucination Uh, so there's a discussion or arguing or conversation is mainly seen in the phrenia next one is the second person hallucination that is like he can hear the other person is blaming him accusing prompting suicide and all it is mainly seen in major depression hearing one's own thought aloud that is also seen in schizophrenia next we can see that visual hallucination so he can see or she can see insects like spiders snakes and the other like so it is mainly seen in organic delirium okay and the lilliputian hallucination it is mainly seen in temporal lobe epilepsy okay it is called factory that is the aura so you know what what do you mean by an aura that is the symptoms or the feeling just before an epilepsy occurs okay so the aura uh, is like a burnt smell is there so it is mainly seen, uh, seen in the temporal lobe epilepsy so temporal lobe epilepsy is otherwise also called as insomnia fret okay next the fall order emanating from the body so it is a hallucination it is seen in major depression next the suppression is false smelling gas applied from outside this is also seen in schizophrenia next is tactile hallucinations the main one is cocaine bug it is a feeling of crawling under your skin okay so feels like a lot of bugs are crawling under your skin it is mainly seen in cocaine cocaine psychosis after the cocaine intoxication next is a bizarre sensation such as radiation electromagnetic waves cosmic rays 
all caused by enemies outside. So bizarre means it is an impossible. Okay, so it is a bizarre sensation that these uh, rays are caused by the enemies from outside. So it is mainly seen in the disease schizophrenia. <coughs> Next, let's see another symptom that comes under uh, disturbance in the perception. So that is illusion. Okay. So illusion this refers to misrecognition of objects or misperception of objects. So here the main thing you have to remember is right. There is a presence of an external stress. That is the main difference between a hallucination and an illusion. In a hallucination, there is an absence of external stimulus, whereas in illusion, there is the presence of an external stimulus. Okay? So the visual illusion occur in delirium and auditory illusions are common in depression. So here the main example what we learn is like the rope is seen as a snake. Okay? So in the other picture also you can see, even though it is all the same, we have a tendency to misperceive the shape at all. So that is called a visual illusion. Okay? So the illusions and hallucinations are not always pathological. Okay? Because we saw that hypnagogic or hypnocompic hallucinations as well as the illusions can be normally present. Now we see micropsia and macropsia. So in micropsia, we can the patient sees that the real object of the figure appears smaller than what they actually are. Whereas in macropsia, the real object of the figure appears more larger than they are actually are. Okay, so these are mostly found in temporal lobe epilepsy. Now we'll see what are the disturbance of phonation, that is a motor activity. So you should not get confused with the terms phonation and cognition. Okay, so this is the disturbance of phonation. In the coming up slides, we'll see what is a cognition. So here, cognition means motor activity. So the symptoms that comes under the disturbance of phonation are psychomotor retardation. When the motor activity is decreased, you have a psychomotor retardation. Psychological stupor, the motor activity is reduced or minimum and the patient is fully conscious, unlike as an organic stupor. Okay? So here, there is no other uh, pathology. So there is a psychological stupor. Then when motor activity is increased, it is called a psychomotor overactivity. Now the other symptoms are like stereotypy, that means monotonous, purposeless repetition of an activity. So stereotypy is monotonous, purposeless, and repetition of an activity. Next is mannerism. So that means the repetitive activity is not monotonously repeated and often goes with normal person activity. So we know that some, uh, some people have the mannerism like always combing the hair, always touching the hair, or uh, uh, making the breast thick. So always they do that. So sometimes that goes with a normal personality. So that is a repetitive activity, but not monotonously repeated. Now the repetition of a previous activity in spite of the patient's support to move on to the new activity is called a preservation of the activity. So preservation is like, even though the a patient want to move to the other activity, he is not able to, he will be repeating the old activity again and again. So among that, Two others are like echopraxia and echolalia. So echopraxia means involuntary repetition or imitation of an activity just seen. And echolalia means the involuntary repetition or imitation of the words just heard. Echolalia and echopraxia. Echopraxia is an imitation of the activity, whereas echolalia means the repetition of the words just heard. Now the other symptoms include catatonia. This term refers to widespread rigidity, which may manifest as waxy flexibility, posturing, magnetism, and etc. So, what we mean by a waxy flexibility? So, it is otherwise called as flexibilitas, sera, or catalepsy. Okay. 
In this disorder, limb can be positioned in any awkward posture for any length of time. So that is vaccine flexibility. It is mainly seen in schizophrenia. Okay. Posturing refers to maintenance of imposed postures, which may be even bizarre and uncomfortable for long periods of time, however awkward they may be. So here this also maintaining a imposed posture for long time. That is uncomfortably long time. Okay. So even though if it is an awkward posture, they will be continuing in the same posture. Next, negativism. This term refers to the resistance to perform an activity or doing opposite to what is expected for a given stimulus. So that is negativism. Now we will see what is the disturbance of cognition. So cognition is motor activity. Whereas cognition refers to an individual's thoughts, knowledge, interpretation, understanding, and ideas about himself and his environment. So cognition or cognitive decline is the hallmark of dementia. We have to uh, give more importance like cognitive decline is the main symptom of dementia. Now we will see the disturbance of memory. The function of memory includes registration, retention, and recollection of the past events and information. The common disturbance of memory is amnesia, which denotes loss of memory. So the different types of amnesia can be either can be global amnesia or progressive or selective for certain events only. So global means in a general way, or selective means mostly only for some incidents. For some uh, objects only, there will be amnesia. The memory loss may be for immediate events, that is, loss of retention, or for a reason or remote events. So, these are the memory losses. Clinically, we get reason memory, remote memory, and immediate. Okay. So, the immediate events loss is like loss of retention, the property, the retention. Because to register something, then you keep it in your mind. That is retention. And then you have to recollect when it is necessary. So these are the three stages. So here, when there is a loss of retention, when you can't retain in your memory, then you can have an immediate memory loss. Okay. The gap in memory can be filled by fabricated and irrelevant events and information. That phenomenon is called a confabulation. So it is what is confabulation means? It is the filling of the memory, either fabricated or you make up a story. Okay, you just fill the memory gap by your own uh, story. That is a confabulation. Next, the disturbance of intelligence. So, intelligence is mainly expressed in terms of intelligence quotient. That is IQ. The average IQ is 100 plus or minus 16. When the intelligence is not proportionately grown, and develop. So then what happens is the mental retardation. Okay. In dementia, on the other hand, the normally acquired intelligence can deteriorate. So in dementia, you know that already the patient would have, have a normal thing. After a while, then he starts to forget. So there can be a uh, acquired intelligence deterioration. So that is dementia. Whereas in mental tradition, the intelligence is not proportionately grown and developed. Now, the main one is the disturbance of insight. So, what is the insight? Insight denotes the abnormalities in state or state of awareness of physical or mental health. It is like you, the people that they will be aware of that I'm having abnormal in my physical health or in my mental health. So that in that awareness is called an insight. Yeah. Psychotic patients believe that they have no illness and so refuse treatment. Whereas the neurotic patients admit their illness but generally refuse to admit their illnesses are psychological. So now we'll see what is the main difference between a psychotic patient and a neurotic patient. Or what do you mean by a psychosis and a neurosis? 
So the main features of psychosis and neurosis are like in psychosis, that is the major psychological disturbances with the loss of contact with the reality, the loss of insight, disintegration of personality, presence of delusion, presence of hallucinations. So these are mainly in schizophrenia and delirium. So that is the features of psychosis. Okay, whereas in neurosis, we can see that there is only minor psychological disturbances with no loss of contact with reality. So they have the uh, awareness of the reality and they have got insight. There is no disintegration of personality. There are no delusions. Typically, no hallucinations except very rarely. So, example in anxiety neurosis or hysterical neurosis. So, these are the main differences. And the one difference is that you have to remember is like in psychosis, there is loss of insight, whereas in, in neurosis, there is no loss of insight. That is a main. Now, we go to the classification of mental disorders. The mental disorders are mainly uh, classified by two organizations. That is one is the American Psychiatric Association. So they have made a system of classification known as Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. That is DSM. Okay. So they have first, the first edition of DSM was in 1952. So, the American Psychiatric Association, they made a system of classification known as Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Whereas, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has made its own system known as International Classification of Disease and Related Health Problems, that is ICD. So, the first edition of ICD came in 1893. Okay. So, these are the two books we have where there is a classification of mental disorders. Now ICD-10 that is now widely followed. Uh, ICD-11 has already is there but not come in a book. It's not published in a book. Okay. So till now we are following widely followed one is ICD-10. Uh, the latest DSM is DSM-5. Okay? Uh, DSM ICD-10 and DSM-5. So in ICD-10, the diagnostic categories are given under the chapter 5 or F. Okay. So ICD-10 has uh, is, is a diagnostic or it is a classification of disease in general. Okay. From A to Z, they have the classification. Whereas the chapter 5 or F is uh, executively or is given only for mental disorders. So each diagnostic category is given an alphabetic letter code F followed by a number code that is an alpha numerical coding. The disorders range from F00 to F99. Now we will see some of the simplified version of the main category of mental disorders. That is F00 to F09 is organic mental disorders. Whereas F10 to F19 is mental disorders due to psychoactive substance use. And F20 to F29 is schizophrenia and delusional disorders. F30 to F39 is more affective disorders. F40 to F49 is neurotic stress related and somatoform disorders. F50 to F59 is behavioral syndromes associated with physiological disturbance. F60 to F69 is personality disorders. F70 to F79 is mental retardation. F80 to F89 is psychological developmental disorders. F90 to F98 is childhood emotional disorders. And F99 is unspecified mental disorders. So these are the main categories. Now we'll see organic mental disorders. From here, we'll start the disorders. <coughs> the range of mental disorders group together on the basis of their common demonstrable etiology in cerebral disease, brain injury, or other insult leading to cerebral dysfunction comes under organic mental disorders. 
So it can be either primary or secondary. So primary injury or the primary diseases like uh, injuries and insult that affect the brain directly, okay, or the predilection. It can that is comes under primary, and the secondary is like all the systemic diseases or the disorders that attack the brain only as one of the multiple organs or systems of the body involved. So it is the secondary. So organic mental disorders are the main group of mental disorders on the basis of um, the cerebral disease or due to brain injury or another insert that leads to cerebral dysfunction. Now let's see what is delirium. The other synonyms for delirium are acute psychoorganic syndrome, acute brain disorder, toxic metabolic encephalopathy, acute constitutional state. And the definition goes by delirium is defined as a transient, usually reversible cause of mental dysfunction and manifests clinically with a wide range of neuropsychiatric abnormalities. So delirium is a transient and mostly reversible, okay, mental dysfunction. Now, the causes, mainly the pneumonic is like I watched death, okay, I is like infection, it can be a urinary infection, pneumonia, and surprises. Uh, w is for withdrawal, withdrawal from alcohol, dangerous pain, and sedatives, hypnotics, and anything can be a acute metabolic syndromes like from alcohol, sedatives or hypnotics, toxins or drugs, then CCNS pathologies like stroke, tumors, seizures, hemorrhage, infections, etc. Hypoxia from anemia, pulmonary, cardiac failure, hypotension, etc. Then some deficiencies, especially thiamine, B12, mostly it is related with alcohol abuse, and endocrine. Um, it can be from thyroid or hyperhyperglycemia, adrenal insufficiency, etc. Then acute vascular affections like shock, hypertension, uh, encephalopathy, etc. Then T for trauma, that is head injury, post operative falls, and all. And then heavy metals. So these are some of the causes for delirium. And the clinical features are the, the first and the most important one is the disturbance in the level of alertness or consciousness and also. So this is the main and important symptom of the day. Okay. Next is attention disturbance, rapidly fluctuating pose and abrupt onset of symptoms, increased or decreased psychomotor activity, disturbance of sleep, wake cycle, mood symptoms, perceptual disturbance, disorganized thinking, incoherent speech, disorientation and memory impairment, other cognitive impairments like dysgraphia, constructal apraxia, dysnomia, etc. Then asterisks, monoclonus, tremor, frontal release signs, changes in muscle tones. So these are the main symptoms of delirium. Next we'll see what is dementia. So the word dementia in Latin means general mental deterioration. Okay. So we know that dementia there is a uh, mental deterioration. Okay. The common types of dementia can be one is dementia from Alzheimer's disease, then multi infarct or vascular dementia, dementia with heavy bodies, Prescott syndrome, frontotemporal dementia, mild cognitive impairment. So these are some of the common types of dementia. We'll see what are the most, uh, some of the features in each. One is Alzheimer's disease. This is the most common type affecting about 60% of the people who have dementia. Caused by changes to the brain, resulting in brain cells being damaged and destroyed. In vascular dementia or multi infarct dementia, it is caused by a reduction in the oxygen supply to the brain. It can be evident gradually as a result of a series of small strokes, okay, TIAs, transient. It results in progressive confusion and reduced ability after each episode. It can be like small, small spots. Now, dementia with Lewy bodies. Lewy bodies are proteins which build up in the brain, which result in the person's brain cells and brain tissue ceasing to function and decline. 
It is distinguished by psychotropic such as hallucinations. Those affected are more prone to fall. So these are the symptoms of Lewy bodies dementia. Now, first of all, syndrome. So it is caused through a lack of vitamin B1. This condition is usually the consequence of alcohol abuse. It's just prompted temporal dementia, FTD. This is the most common cause of pre-senile dementia or the early onset dementia. So in people under 65, damage occurs to the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain, a form called fixed disease. Next is mild cognitive impairment. So this term is used when a person does not have the same level of severe of the symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease. So these are some of the common types of dementias. Now what is the main difference between the delirium and dementia? So in delirium, the onset is acute, whereas in dementia, it is insidious. It will take from months to years. Maybe abrupt in stroke or trauma. So only in that case, it is abrupt. All other is like insidious. Now, in delirium, the vital signs are typically abnormal, like fever, tachycardia, whereas in dementia, it is normal. In delirium, the course is rapid and fluctuating, whereas in dementia, it is progressive. Delirium, the duration is like hours to weeks, whereas in dementia, it is from months to years. Delirium, there is a consciousness altered, and dementia is like usually clear, and there is an impaired attention, and in dementia, there is normal acceptance in severe dementia. Okay? Except in severe dementia, there is the attention is not. In alertness, impaired alertness in delirium, whereas in dementia, there is a normal alertness. Behavior is usually agitated, withdrawn, or depressed, or combination. Whereas in dementia, it is intact early. And the speech is incoherent or rapid or slow. Okay? Problems in finding words can be there in speech, and whereas in delirium, there is increased or decreased psychomotor changes. In dementia, it is normally the psychomotor changes are normal. Okay? In delirium, it is mostly reversible, whereas dementia mostly is irreversible. So those are the main differences between the delirium and dementia. So here, one of the main questions can be the consciousness. Okay? In delirium and dementia, how is the conscious? So consciousness is mostly altered in delirium, whereas it is more clear in dementia. Now we'll see what are amnestic disorders. So the ability to learn new informations are impaired in amnestic disorders. It is called as an anterograde amnesia, whereas the ability to recall previously learned information are called as retrograde amnesia. Okay? The ability to learn new informations are impaired. That is anterograde. Whereas the ability to recall the previously learned information is impaired, then it is called a retrograde amnesia. Now, the main and important topic is schizophrenia. So here, the mental disorders characterized by specific psychological symptoms which interfere with the thinking, emotion, connection, and motor behavior of the patient. So every way, there is an affection. Okay, the mental disorders characterized by specific psychological symptoms which interfere with thinking, emotion, cognition, motor behavior of the patient. So the concept of schizophrenia was initially introduced by Emil Kriplin and, and he termed it as dementia precox. Okay? Dementia is the intellectual deterioration and precox is early onset. Later, Eugene Bluler, he coined the term schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is split and phrenum is mild. Schizophrenia is more common in the lower socioeconomic groups. Now, the main and fundamental symptoms of schizophrenia. Okay? Eugene Bluler classified the clinical features into fundamental symptoms and accessory symptoms. So, the fundamental symptoms are the diagnostic symptoms of schizophrenia, and all other symptoms like delusion, hallucination, etc are included under accessory symptoms. So we'll see what are the fundamental symptoms. So according to Eugene Bluler, he divided the fundamental symptoms into 
four types. One is association. So loosening of mental association similar to the process of dreaming. Now effect. That is a dysfunction between cognitive and affective apparatus. It is ambivalence that is a simultaneous presence of contrary feelings. And autism distanced from reality that is seek their own way engaged in symbolic thinking. So these are the four or these are the primary symptoms or the fundamental symptoms of schizophrenia that is association, affect, ambivalence and autism. The next came Kurt Schrinder. So according to Schrinder, these are the first rank symptoms. There are 11 first rank symptoms. So they are audible thoughts. That is voice speaking thoughts loud. Echo dialogue music. Mixes voices arguing. Two or more hallucinatory voices discussing the subject in the third person. Voices commenting on one's action. That is voices describing subjects activities as they occur. Next is influence playing on the body somatic passivity. That is experience of bodily sensation imposed by external agency. Next is thought withdrawal. That is thought cease and subject simultaneously experiences them as removed by external forces. Next is thought insertion. Thoughts have quality of not being owned or ascribed to the external agency. Thought broadcasting, that is thoughts escape into the outside world where they are experienced by others. Mere feelings, feelings do not seem to be owned attributed to external force. Mere impulses, again, private impulse seems to be alien or external. It is made volitional acts, that is actions and movements felt to be under outside control. Next is delusional perception, that is normal perception has private and logical meanings. So these are the Schrinder's first rank symptoms. That is audible thoughts, voice arguing, voices commenting on one's action, influence playing on the body somatic passivity, thought withdrawal, thought insertion, thought broadcasting, made feelings, made impulses, made volitional acts, and delusional person. So some of the type of schizophrenia according to attend is paranoid, catatonic, maybe phrenic, undifferentiated residual schizophrenia, single schizophrenia, and the last one is post schizophrenic depression. So we'll see what is paranoid. So paranoid schizophrenia is predominated by hallucination and delusions, but personality is usually perceived. Okay. So it is the most common type. It is late onset and it has a good prognosis. Whereas in catatonic, it is predominated by catatonic symptoms. It has a best prognosis. Mostly the first line symptoms is like IV lorazepam and electroconvulsive therapy or ECD. Now the heavy phrenic is the most disorganization symptoms and negative symptoms are in the heavy phrenic type of schizophrenia. It is having the early onset, bad prognosis, and severe deterioration of personality can be seen in heavy frame. Now, undifferentiated, that is not conforming to any of any of the above subtypes. Those all can be put under undifferentiated. Next is residual, that is progression to the decrease in delusion uh, or hallucination, but increase in negative symptoms. Okay, so that is the residual uh, schizophrenia. So that is a progression to Increase in delusion or hallucination, but increase in negative symptoms. So here there will be less of delusion and hallucination. So we know that mostly all the symptoms uh, or all the type of schizophrenia main symptoms will be hallucination and delusion. But some of the type of schizophrenia like residual and symptom. Okay. So here the residual is mainly like. Before one year, they might have got schizophrenia symptoms, and after that, there is no presence. There is no presence of any symptoms of schizophrenia. So they can be a residual, and only some of the symptoms remain from the uh, affection. Okay, that can be the mostly negative symptoms. Now, simple schizophrenia is like prominent negative symptoms without delusion or hallucination. There can be no delusion of hallucination, and it is a worse prognosis, and it is the most difficult 
type of schizophrenia to diagnose. Okay. Our next is the post schizophrenic depression. That is a depressive episodes after resolution of schizophrenia. So they have the high risk of suicide. So those are the different types of schizophrenia. So one is paranoid, next is catatonic, next is hepatophrenic, undifferentiated type, residual type, simple schizophrenia, post schizophrenic depression. Now let's go to the next uh, disorder that is the persistent delusional disorder. So these are a group of disorders characterized essentially by a single type of long standing delusion. So here only delusion is there. There is no hallucination or any other uh, symptoms that are similar to schizophrenia. So if there is only delusion, it is again a single type and a long standing delusion, then it can be persistent delusional disorder. And it was previously known as paranoia. Okay, so when you see the word paranoia, you should not think that is schizophrenia. It is a persistent delusional disorder. Now we'll say mood disorders. The first one is mania. The important features of mania are like elated, expansive mood, high motor activity, richness of ideas, flight of ideas, jocularity. That means the feeling of always telling jokes, humoring. Okay. And next is grandiose delusions. The main four stages is like the stage one is euphoria, stage two is elation, stage three is exaltation. Stage four is STC. So, uh, while discussing the symptoms, we have seen already what they mean. Okay. So, these are the four stages in mania. Next is depression. The depression is otherwise called as pseudo dementia. Okay. Depression is otherwise called as pseudo dementia. So, here the features of depression include sadness of mood, a retarded motor activity, poverty of thinking, delusion of guilt hopelessness, worthlessness, suicidal ideas and attempts, loss of appetite, loss of weight, loss of libido, insomnia and other somatic symptoms. So these are the main features of depression. Next is BPAD, bipolar affective disorder. So bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. Bipolar 1 is the episodes of severe mania plus severe depression. So that is the bipolar 1. Whereas bipolar 2 is episodes of hypomania and severe depression. So hypomania is nothing but when there is the symptoms of mania, what we saw the features of mania, the symptoms will not be in that severity. Okay, so then it, means it is called a hypomania. So when it is called a bipolar disease or bipolar affective disease, when is it called? So when you have a depression and a mania, or else it can be two episodes of mania. When there is only depression, it, it goes for recurrent depressive disorder. More than one episode of depression will go for a recurrent depressive episode. Whereas more than one episode of mania can come for BPAD. And there can be an alternating between depression and mania can also come under BPAD. Okay, So depression and mania. So, uh, BPAD1, that is a bipolar 1, is episodes of severe mania with severe depression. Bipolar 2 is episodes of hypomania with severe depression. Now, let's see anxiety disorders. This first is generalized anxiety disorder. So, GAD, it is otherwise called as anxiety neurosis. So in this disorder, the anxiety is free floating and the symptoms are experienced all the time. Okay, so it is otherwise called as a free floating anxiety. Next is phobic anxiety disorders. Phobia denotes fear, which is specific to an object or situation. The fear is unreasonable and out of proportion to the demand of the situation. The subject avoids the object or situation which evokes the phobia. So there can be a simple phobia, that is, Fear is usually for harmless objects like pen, matchbox, spider, and like. So that can be simple phobia. What we call by a social phobia. So here, the fear is for social situations. Fear of being criticized, okay, criticized of other person. So they have the fear of going into a crowd where they think that they will get criticized. They have the fear of getting onto the stage because of the fear of being criticized. That is social phobia. 
let's test agoraphobia. That means the fear is experienced on getting away from the house or away from being in a comfortable life or being in a situation from which escape seems to be difficult. So they have the fear of that they cannot escape. Okay, if something happens, they will not be able to escape. So that is the main reason for agoraphobia. Now, panic disorder. So panic disorder is characterized by unexpected episodes of intense anxiety. So it is very sudden and there can be unexpected episode of intense anxiety. Mostly it is characterized by chest pain, breathlessness, palpitation, sweating, and a feeling of imminent death. Okay? So he feels like he's going to die. So mostly this panic disorder is mistaken for acute myocardial pain. So they think that they are going to die. So, panic disorder is mostly mistaken for acute myocardial pain. This disorder will remain only from a few seconds to a few minutes. Okay. Next is obsessive compulsive disorder. So, we already seen what is obsession. So, obsessions are unwanted thoughts repeatedly coming into the mind in spite of strong will to get rid of them. So, what is compuls compulsion? So there is the comp subject of compulsion to act accordingly. So obsessions means are thoughts and compulsions are some act. Okay. So in order to compensate this obsession, they have to do something. That is how the obsessive compulsive act is happening. Though the patient is fully aware of this absurdity, he is helpless. He is unable to resist this action. So here the insight is present. He knows that he has some problem. He knows that doing this is not correct or this is a disease, but he is helpless. He has to do that. The main types of obsessive compulsive disorder can be one as predominantly obsessive thoughts. It can be either only thoughts or predominantly compulsive act. It can be some act or it can be a mixed act. So once an obsession is there and then a compulsive act is followed by. So these are the three. So one is predominantly obsessive thoughts, predominantly compulsive act, and a mixed act. It is called as hysterical neurosis. So hysteria, the term was coined by hypocrites. The disorder is characterized by psychogenic loss or disorder of function. When the symptoms are confined to the sensory, motor, or visceral function, it is called a conversion disorder. Okay. Whereas when it is only psychic in nature, it is a dissociative disorder. Okay. So this is conversion disorder. We can see that there is symptoms like motor symptoms, tremors, seizures, sensory symptoms, special senses are affected, visceral symptoms. So we'll see motor symptoms. So the various types of paralysis and paralysis like hemiplegia, monoplegia, and paraplegia, desert gait, and mutism are common in motor symptoms. Then you have tremors and seizures. Then sensory symptoms, they include anesthesia, paresthesia, and hypersthesia. So the one thing is that there will be no relation with the anatomically distributed areas of the nerves. Okay. Here, uh, the patient knows that okay, uh, there will be clear demarcation. Okay, only in my palm, I have anesthesia like that. They have a clear demarcation. Now, the special senses are like blindness and deafness may occur. And visceral symptoms, they can be symptoms like vomiting, retention of urine, constipation, loss of appetite. So, even though the patient goes to all the doctors, they will not find any reasons why they are having these symptoms. So the dissociative disorders can be like dissociative amnesia, dissociative fugue, dissociative somnambulism. Dissociative multiple personality or dissociative identity disorder. Hysterical trance are some of the common manifestations of dissociative disorders. Next is somatoform disorders. So here it includes a set of psychiatric disorders presenting with the symptoms of a physical illness, but with no physical findings, either on examination or repeated investigations. Here also the patient goes for doctor shopping. Okay, from one doctor to another, and they doesn't find any uh, anything wrong with the patient. But still, they will be 
having some physical illness so the symptom the disorder that comes under somatoform disorder is one is somatization disorder hypochondriacal disorder somatoform pain disorders are the common types so in somatization disorder there can be multiple and often changing symptoms of the person whereas in hypochondriacal disorder the patients are preoccupied with physical illness and in somatoform pain disorder or it is a psychogenic pain disorder whereas chronic pain such as headache low back ache pelvic pain and chest pain are the common symptoms so all these disorder they will have no physical findings on examinations or on investigations now what do you mean by peculiar disorder in this disorder the symptoms of mental or physical illness are purposefully adopted in order to remain in the sick role and avoid specific situations but there is no any external gain okay so that is the fictitious disorder whereas in malingering in this condition symptoms of mental disorder or physical illness may be seen by the person to get some external gain okay. so uh, this is mainly the secondary gain okay where the monetary gain they need some money so in this condition again the mental disorder or the physical illness may be seen to get some external gain next is cultural bond symptoms so these symptoms are specific to some different countries or to some culture the examples are like one is possession state okay. here the normal what we say that is the individuals are seen talking and acting not in their own self but in the role of others being possessed by phenomena such as spirit of a dead relative or a friend or a person who met with an unnatural death a god or a goddess and a devil so these comes in possession states which is a cultural bond syndrome so if there's a question that we ask the possession state comes under this uh, syndrome it is a cultural bond syndrome next is that syndrome so in some books it is double t d h a double t and in some books you can see d h a t also uh, the syndrome is common among young males mostly prevalent in the northern part of india they complain of losing semen before and after passing urine so this is again a cultural condition that is commonly seen in northern parts of india now we'll say some of the personality disorders okay so the term personality is derived from the greek word persona that means mask okay so the personality disorders are mainly divided into three clusters and this classification is given by dsc okay? cluster a cluster b and cluster c the cluster a contains paranoid schizoid and schizotypal whereas in cluster b it is anti social borderline personality disorder histrionic personality disorder narcissistic personality disorder and in cluster c you can see avoidant personality disorder dependent personality disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder so the other personality disorders include personality change due to another medical condition or other specified personality disorder and you can also have the uh, if the personality disorder that doesn't come under any of the above mentioned then you can put it under unspecified personality disorders so on um, what clusters on what basis is the clusters being grouped that is cluster a they have on bizarre and eccentric type of symptoms okay they are all bizarre and eccentric whereas b is like a dramatic and erratic symptoms but c has a anxious and fearfulness so these are the main characteristics of the three clusters a or bizarre and eccentric B is dramatic and erratic, and C is anxious and fearful. Now we'll see some of the psychoactive substance use disorders. Okay, the psychoactive substance or drugs are of different kinds. One is alcohol, amphetamine, and others is cannabis that includes ganja, charas, bhang, and hashish. Then cocaine, 
caffeine that includes coffee and tea, hallucinogens like LSD, mescaline, then volatile solutions such as petrol, ether, benzene, nitrite, nitrous oxide, tobacco that is nicotine, then opioids like morphine, codeine, heroin, hepatitin, and methadone, pentazone, sedatives, and hypnotics. Okay, next is tranquilizers. So these are the psychoactive substances commonly. Uh, that are used and these are the features of uh, the psychoactive substances known as acute intoxication so when the drug use is transient that's in the question time a picture of acute intoxication results abnormal psychic and physical symptoms appear symptoms depend upon the drug use they disappear as the drug is discontinued that is acute intoxication and pathological intoxication is only for alcohol in mean, a large amount of state. That time you have a pathological intoxication. Next is harmful use or abuse. That is heavy substance use may lead to damage to physical health. Example, alcoholic hepatitis, social health, whereas as a disapproval and criticism, and in mental health, example is like depression. So that is use or abuse. So the next feature is the dependence syndrome. So these are altered physiological and mental states. That is an alteration of mood, behavior and cognition. You have prolonged use of the drug. The withdrawal symptoms occurs when the substance is abruptly discontinued. There is overwhelming desire to accomplish to continue the drug in order to overcome the unpleasant effect. So this state it is called a dependence syndrome. Next is tolerance is another feature. So effect of the drug diminishes with repeated use of the same dose. What happens is like when the when the person is taking uh, alcohol or any other psychoactive substance continuously, so the amount he was taking to reach a uh, pleasurable level was a certain amount. Okay. After some times that amount will become insufficient for him to reach that state of pressure. So he has to take an increased dose. So that is called a tolerance. Okay? So the effect of the drug diminishes with repeated use of the same dose. The dose has to be increased progressively to get the same effect. Interest and pressure in other useful activities diminishes during this. Next is withdrawal state. This develops once the drug is discontinued after long use. Physical symptoms and psychological symptoms are same. Next is amnesic syndrome. So constant environment in recent memory is a prominent symptom. Events and time sense are confused for confabulation of this. So we have seen what is confabulation, that is a fabrication. Next, we move to eating disorder. In eating disorder, the main two symptoms or main two diseases are anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. We'll see what are they. So, in anorexia nervosa, the weight is significantly underweight. That is, bulimia, normal weight or overweight. So, what are the eating habits for anorexia nervosa? They eat little food or they eat only few calories. Whereas in Bulimia nervosa, they eat large amount of food, then tortures by vomiting and or using laxatives. So this is the main symptom. When, whereas anorexia, they, they do not eat. Okay? Whereas in Bulimia, they eat large amount of food and they vomit or use laxatives. <coughs> so in anorexia and in Bulimia, both have the concerns on weight and appearance. But in anorexia, even though they are dangerously thin, they have false image that the body is still fat. Okay, that is anorexia. The medical symptoms include weakness, fatigue, nutritional deficiencies, and low blood pressure for anorexia. Whereas weakness, fatigue, dehydration, mouth and throat problems, that is mainly due to uh, 
for G or vomiting, they have these symptoms. Next, we move on to sleep disorders. The main sleep disorders are insomnia, hypersomnia, and parasomnia. So, insomnia are like it is most common sleep disorder. It may be primary or secondary. So, primary you cannot find any specific cause, whereas secondary can be any other diseases like in medical in medical or in psychiatric any other diseases which cause later sleep disturbance okay. that goes to insomnia whereas hypersomnia is a condition where there is an excessive sleep so narcolepsy is the most common manifestation narcolepsy is a disabling sleep disorder characterized by excessive daytime sleepiness and abnormal rapid eye movement the values of CSF hypocretin is lower than 110 nanogram per liter are highly suggestive of narcolepsy. So you have to remember the CSF hypocretin that is lower than 110 nanogram per liter. Now parasomnias are abnormal events occurring during sleep. Example nightmare, night terror and sleepwalk. What are nightmare? It occurs during rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep. The person may get up from the sleep with frightening dreams. The content of the dream is recollected the next day. Okay? Whereas in night terror, the person, often a child, gets up from the sleep frightened, terrified, confused, disoriented, screaming aloud, clinging to others around, or running for help. The episode is not remembered the next morning. So this is the main difference between nightmare and night terror. In nightmare, the person will remember uh, the dream the next day. Whereas in night terror, the episode will not be remembered the next day. Excess sleep walking. This occurs during non-rapid eye movement sleep. That is NREM. The person may get up while asleep and perform various activities like taking a bath, getting dressed up, and even going for a walk on the journey. The activity can be terminated by waking up. The events are not recollected when awake. So, nightmare happens in REM sleep, whereas sleepwalking happens in NREM sleep, that is, non rapid eye movement sleep. Now let's see some of the sexual dysfunction. So the sexual dysfunction due to psychological cause is only kept here. The different disorders include reduction or loss of sexual desire and lack of sexual enjoyment, lack of genital response, which includes impotence in men and absence of sexual arousal in women, orgasmic dysfunction, which includes premature or retarded ejaculation in men and orgasmic failure in women, vaginismus and dyspnea in women, and painful ejaculation in men. So the main disorder is known as erectile disorder, that is impotence. Impotence is the inability to get or sustain erection sufficient enough for satisfactory purpose. Whereas in premature ejaculation, this is the occurrence of ejaculation. Early during the sexual intercourse, before penetration, or soon after that. So, here we know that these two can be due to some problems in the structure also. But these are classified in psychiatry only when the, those everything is normal. These disorders can be due to a psychological cause. So, that time these are classified in uh, the category F. Okay. So in ICD. The abnormal sexual preference is otherwise called as paraphilias. So the first one is fetishism, that is libido gratification from contact with articles such as breast, hair, and others of the opposite sex. It is pedophilia, an unnatural urge and desire to have sexual relationship with children of pre pubertal age. Exhibitionism. Tendency to exhibit his or her genitals to the members of the opposite sex in public for sexual pleasure. Next is sexual sadism, that is, sexual pleasure derived from inflicting mental or physical pain on the sexual partner. 
sexual masochism that is sexual pressure derived by being abused or being acted cruelly by the opposite partner your reason this is a phenomena in which a person derives sexual pleasure by observing sexual activity of others scopophilia this is sexual pleasure obtained from visual sources such as nudity in the opposite sex and obscene pictures so these are some of the paraphilia that is a abnormal sexual preference okay abnormal sexual preferences next we'll see mental retardation so the main thing in mental retardation what you have to see is the grades of mental retardation the grades the iq range the mental age of that mr then how much percentage it can be occurred the most common causes the first one is mild they are otherwise called more on feeble mindedness they have an iq range of 50 to 69 they have a mental age less than 9 and 85 percentage of occurrence rate main causes psychosocial moderate they are otherwise called imbecility the iq range ranges 35 49 mental ages under 6 the occurrence rate is only 10 percentage the most common causes are down syndrome fragile x syndrome penile ketonuria now the severe mr that is the iq range between 20 to 34 so here the mental ages between 3 and 6 and the occurrence is 3 to 4 percentage most common causes can be microcephaly cretinism and cerebral palsy okay the last one is profound idiocy that is below 20 iq below 20 the mental age is below 3 the occurrence rate is only 1 to 2 percentage and the microcephaly cretinism or cerebral palsy can be the most common causes so you have to see what is the iq range and the grade of mr that is more important Okay, whether it is like mild, then what is IQ range? It is 50 to 69. If it is a moderate, it is 35 to 49. If it is severe, it is 20 to 34. And when it is a profound idiocy, it is below 20. So those were the grades of MR. Now we will see psychiatric disorders in childhood and adolescence. Okay, the common types of learning disabilities. One is dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia, dyspraxia. Okay. So these are the most common type of learning disabilities. In dyslexia, there can be difficulty in reading. So problems in reading, writing, spelling, and speaking can be uh, the other symptoms. Dyscalculia is difficulty with math, like problems doing math problems, understanding time, using money. and all can be seen this graphia there is difficulty with writing problems with handwriting spelling organizing ideas dyspraxia that is sensory integration disorder so here there is difficulty with fine motor skills it can be the problems with hand eye coordination balance manual dexterity etc the last one is dysphasia or aphasia that is difficulty with language problems understanding spoken language poor reading comprehension can be seen in those so these are some of the common types of learning disabilities of disorders now we'll see the other symptoms or other disorders like pervasive developmental disorders the pervasive developmental disorders contains autistic disorder that is classic autism rex syndrome it is a specific genetic disorder of post natal brain development so after the birth okay the development of the brain is a problem caused by a single gene defect predominantly affecting girls it affects only girls and childhood disintegrated disorder that is a regression of the cognitive behavior and language so already there will be uh, the development of cognition language and behavior but then later it regresses back it happens between 2 and 10 years so after 2 years there is a regression so that is childhood disintegrative disorder it is preceded by entirely normal development so there was a normal development and then there is a regression next is asperger's disorder so here 
the language development in the expected age without a mental retardation can be seen. There is a language, uh, the language can be very developed, very less, okay? But there is no mental retardation. Now, pervasive development disorders where uh, the other, the above mentioned features are not there, means they can be included in the not otherwise specified, okay? So, PDD not otherwise specified is like individuals with some autistic features and do not belong to the above categories. So, this is pervasive developmental disorders. So, in that, one of the main one is childhood autism. It is otherwise called as infantile autism. The other name is Tanner syndrome. Okay, Tanner syndrome is none other than autism. So, childhood autism was originally described by Leo Kanner in 1943 as early infantile autism. The term autism denotes the state of absorption into one's own world of fantasy with loss of contact with the reality. Okay? So, the main symptoms of autism includes there is problem in language skills, there can be social issues, repetitive manners, obsessed with something and attachment to certain object. So these are the main symptoms of autism. The other are like that there will be no eye-to-eye -eye contact or not, okay? The next one is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. It is otherwise called as hyperkinetic syndrome, okay? This disorder is more common in boys and the main cardinal features include persistent inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, okay? So, these are the three main cardinal features of ADHD. That is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or hyperkinetic syndrome. And the next one is contact disorders, persistent, dissocial, aggressive, or deviant behavior are the presenting features. So, we can see there is an aggressive, persistent, dissocial, and deviant behavior in conduct disorder. So, this can be seen in children. If this disorder is remained uh, untreated, then they can go for antisocial personality disorder. Okay? Conduct disorder can progress into antisocial personality disorder later in their life. And the last one we'll see in the childhood disorder is enuresis or bedwetting. So enuresis is the voiding of urine during sleep persisting after the age of five years. Okay, so normally uh, there should be control of the bladder by the age of five. But when it is persisting even after the age of five years, it can be called as enuresis. In primary enuresis, the child has never attained bladder control after birth. Whereas in secondary enuresis, the child has attained bladder control, which is subsequently lost later. Okay, so those are the symptoms of enuresis. So I think we have almost covered most of the portions of our psychiatry. So all the best and thank you.